It's uh, my honor uh, to introduce to you Linda Black Elk, um, who is an ethnobotanist and works at um, Sitting Bull College in Fort Yates, um, North Dakota. And if Fort Yates might sound familiar to you because it was at the center of the um, Standing Rock movement, and I asked um, Linda a few minutes ago if it would be appropriate if I said, but I stand with Standing Rock, <laughs> because I do stand with Standing Rock, and I know, um, just speaking briefly with her, that um, her work is so important at looking at the environmental consequences um, of our fossil fuels and, and fracking and uh, poor water um, management issues. I want to be sure to give her the optimal amount of time at the microphone, so um, I am going to turn it over to um, Linda, who will be speaking about food is medicine. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much. Hi, everybody. I'm Linda Black Elk. I'm actually a member of the Catawba Nation, uh, but I've lived on Standing Rock over half my life now. My kids are enrolled there. Um, and uh, I'm really proud to live there and be a part of that community. Um, I, I was fine. Um, I, I, you know, I get nervous before I give these talks, and nervous energy is kind of good. But I was fine until um, I got a text message from my husband a few minutes ago. I looked at my phone, and it said, because he knew I was nervous, he said, take deep breaths, and remember that you're a warrior. Oh. <laughs> he knew exactly what to say to kind of get me emotional and um, probably the best compliment I've ever received from any person. Um, and, um, you know, the reason that he said that is because I've spent the last year on Standing Rock on the front lines getting shot by rubber bullets, getting pepper sprayed. I got tear gassed twice. I got sprayed with water cannons in sub-freezing temperatures. Um, all through my work, working as a medic at Standing Rock, um, using traditional medicine to heal people who were there in the camps um, and transporting patients to receive that care. And um, so it's, you know, it's just such an honor to be here and to talk to you guys a little bit about some of the work that I've done there, all of which comes from our ancestors I, I give all credit to my elders who give, pe gave, uh, give me permission to talk about the things I'm going to talk about today. These talks are actually really difficult for me. Um, normally, I'm used to, and wouldn't this be way more fun, is if we could just all go outside and look at plants and harvest them and then like eat them or make like, an amazing salve out of them. That's what I'm used to doing. I'm used to working with small groups of students in those kinds of atmospheres, and I don't talk a lot about the literature. For me, putting this talk together and, and looking at the literature and looking at the data, um, it's kind of like working out. Um, I know it's good for me. I know that I will benefit greatly from it. I know that I'll probably feel better about myself after I do it, right? Um, but actually motivating myself to get in there and do it. That's another thing entirely. But so for you guys, just you know, knowing my audience, I wanted to make sure to include a lot of the literature in my talk, but I'll also include a lot of native science in my talk. And you know, I think about the sort of theme of the conference, which is indigenous wisdom and science uh, converging. Um, but I dare say that that's a little inaccurate because indigenous wisdom is science. And until we look at that, until we respect indigenous wisdom as science, um, native science, you know, this collective knowledge of thousands of people over thousands of years interacting with the landscape, right? Participating with the landscape, participate, participating with our plant relatives, until we respect that as science, I don't think that we will have exactly the, the kind of mood that we're looking for. And so, you know, I, I, as I said, have spent the last year not just defending my children, not just defending the water, but defending these plant relatives that I'm going to talk to you guys about today. And so I want you to know that when I talk about these foods, when I talk about these foods that are also medicine, 
when I talk about the ways that they heal us, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually as well, I talk about them as my friends. I talk about them as my relatives. And so I hope that you guys will begin to think of them that way too. I give these kinds of talks in the hopes that I can change people's perceptions of these plants that they walk over every day. Because I feel like if we can convince these corporations, if we can convince even the oil companies that these plants are our relatives and that they can heal us in ways that people have never even thought of, um, except for indigenous people, of course, <laughs> but the ways that Western science perhaps has never even thought of, perhaps they'll work to start to protect them too. And so I'd really like to talk to you guys today about some of my absolute favorite medicinal foods, foods that I incorporate into my diet every day, sometimes in ways that aren't necessarily as healthy as they should be. But I always figure if I can just incorporate a few of these plants into our diet and start my kids off kind of slowly and make sure they have a taste for these medicinal foods, you know, everything that we eat these days, we think it has to be either sweet or salty, right? And we forget about the immense deliciousness and healthfulness of bitter foods, um, things that just have a little bit of those bitter alkaloids, right? We forget about how important that is. Um, one of the foods that a lot of people, uh, 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 something that's been getting a lot of attention lately, I actually have up there, um, buffalo berry, Schipertia argentea, which in 2015 was declared a new superfood, right? Uh, more antioxidants than acai berries or blueberries, um, more lycopene than tomatoes, uh, a, a superfood that only grows pretty much on reservations uh, throughout North South Dakota and uh, Montana. That's a buffalo berry pie up there, by the way. Uh, absolutely, incredibly delicious. I figure if I can get people to eat buffalo berries by putting them into a pie, getting them to think about protecting them, then it's worth it. So I'm just gonna talk about a few of, of uh, other of my favorite medicinal plants today. So for example, rose hips. Um, I like to walk around when I'm talking, but I, I can't do that here. I'm chained to this podium. Um, <laughs> rose hips are uh, wild rose, even the petals. Uh, a beautiful, beautiful plant. I love to put rose hips um, into soups and stews. They add a little bit of sweet tartness. They taste something like a cross between a cranberry and an apple. Um, they make, of course, amazing jams and jellies. But rose hips are super high in vitamin C, 200% of our recommended daily allowance of vitamin C, 125% fiber. There's a lot of information and facts up there. I won't read it all off to you, but rose hips are absolutely one of my favorite medicinal foods. Um, there are a lot of stories, traditional stories among the Lakota in particular, about rose hips. One of my favorites, um, which you guys will have to forgive me because I'm going to say kind of a, a little uh, bad word here. But there's a, there's a story about Ikdomi the trickster. You know, I, I think all of us have trickster tales, trickster stories. Um, Ikdomi is the spider. And there's a story about rose hips. And it's about Ikdomi eating all the rose hips very greedily. He was going around consuming all the rose hips. And, you know, people kept telling him, mm, you better not eat too many of those without processing them first. You're gonna have some trouble later because if you open up the rose hip, you see that the seeds in there are covered with tiny little sharp hairs. And if you don't remove those, you certainly will have a problem later. And I love uh, the elder who actually told me this story calls it the story of Ikdomi and the itchy ass berries. And uh, there's nothing like a 90-year-old elder in a wheelchair talking to you about someone's itchy anus. Um, it, 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 it affected me, you know? But that's what it's supposed to do, right? Because Ikdomi had such a hard time later. He had been eating all these rose hips without removing the seeds. And later on, 
um, he, he had such trouble, his, it was so itchy uh, that he was like reaching up inside. This is what the elder did. She said he was reaching up inside and just trying to scratch and scratch and, and you know, could never get all of the hairs out and it mortified me. And so of course that works because I will never eat too many rose hips without removing the seeds, right? The, those stories they tell us about how we should utilize these plants, that's indigenous science and information being passed on from one generation to the next through these stories. Um, it's so absolutely amazing. So one of my favorite foods, ob obviously incredibly medicinal, extracts of rose hips, antimicrobial against uh, yeast, including um, uh, thrush in babies' mouths, um, and also uh, uh, ac active against gram-positive bacteria. Uh, they exhibit anti-inflammatory actions as well as anti-diabetic and anti-cancer effects. So they allow us to have a little bit of sweet. I love to mix uh, some rose hips into uh, my corn muffins. Um, um, or sometimes I'll make acorn muffins and I love to put some rose hips in there. It's kind of like having a cranberry muffin when you do that. Um, and, and, you know, I, I tell my kids, this isn't just food, this is medicine as well. Um, yarrow, Achillea millifolium, another one of my favorite medicinal foods. I keep a jar of yarrow powder in my cupboard at all times. And the fantastic thing about it is that you can sprinkle it on pasta with just a little bit of olive oil and garlic and you know maybe some crushed red pepper flakes, absolutely delicious. Or you can actually use that powdered yarrow leaf as a wound powder. So if my son goes outside and, and cuts his, his leg or scrapes his knee or something like that, I can actually just take a little bit of that same yarrow powder that I used in this pasta dish and I can sprinkle it on his knee and it completely stops the bleeding, immediately stops the bleeding. And it's actually really a wonder to see yarrow at work. I've seen, um, we, we were out mending fence one day. I don't know if any of you, country girl, uh, we were out fixing fence in a buffalo pasture. And uh, my cousin, long story short, had to end up diving through the fence to escape a buffalo bull. And as he dove through the fence, he scraped his leg from knee to waist on a piece of barbed wire, and it was just gushing blood. And so a bunch of us who were there, our cousins, we started harvesting those yarrow leaves, crushing them up in our hands and making him, chew, you know, stuffing some into his mouth so that he could chew it up and, and then spit the pulp out on this, this monstrous cut on his leg. And it was, you know, gushing blood until we put the yarrow on. And then it just instantly stopped bleeding, instantly. Absolutely amazing because this is the knowledge of our ancestors, right? This is that native science I was talking about. I love to talk about the convergence of native and Western science and how they intersect and how they meet. Because often we've come to the same conclusions over time, you know, with our long-term observational data and, and, and the, the, the experimentation, you know, that shorter-term experimentation in Western science, we have often come to the same conclusions over time. And uh, you know, I think, I think that's fascinating because yarrow has actually been used by numerous cultures all over the world to do the exact same things. So I went to a conference once in Italy and there were women there from almost every continent, you know, except Antarctica. And all of those women were selling a lot of their traditional medicines in little bags and talking about how they were used. And I was fascinated because all of the women had yarrow with them, all of them, from, from all of those continents. It's just fantastic, you know? And, and so we've all uh, come to a lot of the same conclusions about these. Yarrow's also uh, been shown uh, in, in Western medicine to be effective against wounds, uh, and to, to heal wounds. It's also um, a natural antioxidant in the treatment of cancer. Um, the a yarrow extract uh, uh, has been shown to reduce the size of gastric ulcers which I always think if we were doing like what uh, Mr. Ferguson was saying earlier and eating our traditional diet, we wouldn't have to worry about gastric ulcers. But um, because that is a part of our daily lives, yarrow uh, has been shown to be active against those. It's absolutely amazing. Um, another one of my favorite medicinal foods is hops, which of course a lot of people know from beer making. Um, but what a lot of people don't realize is that hops have actually been used by indigenous people for thousands of years. Um, 
as a food and also as a medicine. Um, I have a photo there of some bread that I made from hops water. Uh, traditionally, br bread actually, a lot of people think that um, bread isn't traditional for a lot of Plains tribes, Great Plains tribes, but, but it is. It's just normally made out of things like cattail flour, acorn flour, um, you know, the ground up root of Pediomelum esculentum, also known as prairie turnip, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and we would use hops water to actually make the bread rise because hops promote CO2 production. And so, and so you can actually make your own hops yeast. So if you've ever wondered, uh, without the uh, presence of yeast, how, how did people get bread to rise? Hops is, is, um, is one way to, to do it. But we also use hops traditionally to treat fevers and intestinal pain. It's used to treat sleeplessness and anxiety. And we all know that hops contain a natural sedative. Um, it, they contain humulone. And, and the, the really cool thing is that Western science has always recognized that as well, as has native science. But something that Western science didn't know is that you can use hops very effectively to treat anxiety. And it's been used that way for a very long time by, by people all over the world. And so now um, there's actually research being conducted um, to use hops, uh, a derivative of hops, um, as a really safe anti-anxiety medication, as, as actually in a tea form. Um, and it has none of the side effects of a lot of those really, really dangerous anti-anxiety drugs that are out there. So it's really uh, fantastic. Uh, in bioassays that were um, done, they also found that hops contain one of the most potent phytoestrogens known to man. And so it's being used, and they've actually found that same phytoestrogen in beer, just so you know. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so it's actually being uh, used, hops, and hops indeed have been used by indigenous people uh, for women who are going through menopause, um, but it's being investigated as a really great source of phytoestrogen for those purposes. So burdock, another one of my favorites, and it's funny because... I'll go visit a lot of my friends here in Minnesota, and they tell me that this is one of the biggest pains in their backsides, this, this plant, <laughs> because it's such a common weed in their yard, and it has this crazy taproot that, you know, if you don't dig out every single bit of the taproot of burdock, the plant will come back again. It's incredibly resilient. It's actually a great example to all of us. Um, if you've ever seen burdock, it sort of looks like rhubarb, wild rhubarb, um, and it's, it's one of my favorite foods. Right there, I have some burdock root chips. Um, no, you know, I, I'm sorry, you'll notice a theme of fried. Um, it, you know, in particular, you'll notice a theme of bacon grease and fried in my presentation, and I know that that's not traditional, but it sure does taste really good, and it's a very, very easy way to get people to try a lot of these foods for the first time, um, because when you have something that's dusted in beautiful corn flour that you have actually ground yourself from corn that you grew, and, you know, you, you bake it up a little bit in the oven, you know, coat it with, coat them with a little bit of bacon grease first, and always nice. Um, and you, you uh, feed that to people, they're like, oh my gosh, wow, I never thought of this weed as having food value before. Even some of uh, our own uh, people, um, you know, I, I have, th there's a real disconnect and a distrust with traditional foods that we have to address, that we can't hide from ourselves. We can't, you know, uh, uh, um, I, I really like the idea of starting our children eating these foods off first thing so that they have that palate for it. But I also think about, you know, my kids, you know, and, and, and all of these kids I work with who are in the sixth grade by the time I get to them. And um, every time I mention eating a dandelion leaf, they say, ew, why would you eat that weed? You know? And so we have to address that as well, those, those trust issues, you know? And so, of course, I love to freak them out a little bit and talk, you know, we go out, we collect dandelion greens, I wash them off really nicely, I bring them back into the, into the classroom and, 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 you know, maybe put some sunflower seeds on top of there. And then I put a little bit of my own homemade ranch dressing um, that doesn't have the bad chemicals in it, Gary. 
just it's homemade, it's homemade. Um, home, my own homemade ranch dressing on there. And the kids look at it and they say, oh, that's just salad. I'll eat that. And so I get them eating bowls of dandelion greens and they just think about how delicious it is and how amazing it was that it was free, you know? And so this is, this is another way I feed them burdock chips and they're like, whoa, this is growing in my backyard, you know? And, and they're just amazed by it, amazed that they're able to actually, you know, this thing that just grows wild, this gift from the creator, they're able to just dig it up and, and, and you know, eat it. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing to them. Um, but it's not just delicious. It doesn't just hold food value. Uh, it's effective against throat infections, including, um, including strep throat. Um, I've used it very effectively in a salve form in the treatment of, uh, of uh, psoriasis and eczema, all that dry winter skin, things like that, uh, you know, dry elbows. Um, burdock salve is, is fantastic for that. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's actually backed up a lot uh, by Western science, you know, as being uh, effective in protecting the liver. Um, it's anti-inflammatory. It's, it's free radical scavenging. So, of course, you know, anti-cancer is what that uh, says to us. So it's just an amazing plant. And I just have to tell you a quick story about, um, you'll see the, the flower heads on there. Um, just a little bit of trivia for you. If you've ever wondered who came up with the idea or how they came up with the idea for Velcro, it was um, the structure of burdock seed pods. Um, are the exact same structure as, as Velcro. That's where the guy came up with it. They were sticking to his dog's hair, and then he'd noticed that they stuck to each other very effectively, and he came up with the idea for Velcro. So. Um, I was actually talking with this about some of my friends from the Hopi Nation earlier. Uh, Monarda fistulosa, also known as bee balm. The Lakota name, Hechaka Kapejuta, actually means elk medicine. And that is uh, just a little clue that this plant is used as love medicine. Um, my husband gets teased all of the time that he must have had a lot of this on hand um, when he and I got together. Um, but uh, it's also, uh, you know, when I was, uh, I worked with seventh graders in Bozeman, Montana for a while, and I used to have them swab the inside of their cheek and grow all the disgusting stuff in their mouths on Petri dishes, you know, inoculate uh, uh, the auger in, in Petri dishes. And, and then what I'd have them do is I'd have them put different plants on these Petri dishes and have them look for that ring of inhibited growth around the plant, you know, to look for antimicrobial activity in these plants in a seventh grade classroom. And the one that always stood out as just being, you know, blowing away those, those microbes in those Petri dishes was Monarda fistulosa. Over and over again, we saw it kill bacteria and eliminate viruses. It's just absolutely incredible. Uh, and it's a really good way to get your seventh graders to start thinking about not kissing people yet. Um, because they see all the disgusting stuff they're growing from their mouths and they're like, okay, I'll hold off for a little while longer. Um, but it, you know, just absolutely amazing plant. Uh, th that photo there is actually chocolate bee balm cookies. Um, but my favorite way to actually use bee balm as a food is um, as a savory element because it has sort of the aroma of oregano um, and the flavor of thyme and oregano mixed together when it's dried. And so uh, one of you know, my students in my ethnobotany class for their final exam, uh, their final exam is that they have to make a dish using traditional foods and bring it to class. And one year, uh, one of my students made pizza. And um, uh, he actually made a crust. You know, he went out and he found all these different kinds of traditional flowers and he made his own pizza crust. And then he went out and he got hawthorn berries, which I'll talk about later. And he made his own pizza sauce out of traditional foods. And he, he flavored the whole thing with wild onions and bee balm. And it was, oh, and he put elk sausage on there too, which didn't hurt. But um, <laughs> it was absolutely amazing and delicious, you know? And so I, I just absolutely love them both sweet up. Uh, love bee balm, sweet and savory. Um, 
Uh, it's used regularly by our diabetes program to inhibit the growth of infective bacteria in wounds, such as diabetic ulcers um, on people's legs. Uh, we were having elders who were losing toes, losing limbs to infection, of course, um, from that lack of circulation due to diabetes. We started handing out um, uh, bee balm so that they could make a very strong decoction of it and soak their limbs in it and we were able to cut down on um, in these infections astronomically. It's absolutely incredible. Um, it's uh, been shown to be really effective against bacteria, in particular staph. Um, we actually chew this plant up um, and, and put it onto boils, and even uh, we've found it to be effective against MRSA and MRSA sores on the reservation. Uh, very useful. Um, it's, uh, you know, just a, a wonderful thing uh, to, to have around. And, and I, I tried to include plants in here that I know grow all over, even from up into Canada, down into Mexico. So this is something that we all have access to. I love, uh, we, we actually have a lot of this growing in our yard because I just took one tiny little plant from out on the prairie a few years ago and I planted it in my yard and now we have a whole bed of this growing, which, you know, native plants tend to do that. So it's wonderful to have around. Um, another one of my favorites, of course, the ever-hated dandelion. And I, I couldn't believe, I actually forgot to put this in my presentation until this morning, and I was sitting up there, like, adding it in because I just couldn't believe that I had forgotten it. You know, it's so maligned in our culture, right? And, and my neighbor just just despises our lawn because we eat the, the weeds, quote unquote, that grow in our lawn, including the dandelions. And, um, you know, I'll see him over there with his, uh, you know, who owns their own sprayer thing, you know, but he does. He owns his own little weed killer sprayer thing. And I just, he like wears it around his waist and like walks around his yard. I just think that's so bizarre. But, um, you know, you see him over next to our property line and he kind of like scoots close over and he'll look up into our windows to see if we're home and I'll start spraying into our yard as much as possible because he just hates the fact that we have all of these amazing plants growing in our yard, in our lawn. Um, and dandelions, you know, absolutely one of the ones that uh, even my kids, they know where the dandelion shovel hangs and they just walk right outside and they'll dig up, you know, 10 or 11 of them. They'll get the leaves to use for salad that night for dinner. Um, and they know that they need to wash off the roots and put them on the drying rack. And that's it's just what they do. And they do it, you know, three or four times a week when we uh, add these leaves to our salad. Um, if you have not, uh, I, that first quote up there was actually from a phone a conversation I had with Dr. Pandy out of the University uh, of, of Windsor in Canada. Um, if you have not read about the Un University of Windsor's dandelion study in the treatment of certain cancers, make sure to look that up. They had amazing results in just using dandelion root to treat certain types of cancer. Mind-blowing results that um, I believe have not yet been formally published. I think they're still working on it, um, analyzing the data, but they actually had permission to use dandelion root in human clinical trials because of the initial uh, uh, results that they got. And um, it was kind of funny talking to him, you know, it's just a, a, a way, the difference between the way an ethnobotanist and a Western scientist, a physician thinks, right? Because I called him up and I was so excited. Oh, I heard you're using dandelion root um, uh, in your treatments, you know, uh, uh, up there and you have clinical trials. And in his very strong Indian accent, he said, yes. He said, uh, we actually process it. It's sort of a difficult process. We acquire the dandelion root organically uh, that's grown organically, and we wash it, and we dry it, and then we powder it, and then we boil it and, uh, until it's very strong, and then we have people drink it. And I said, oh, you're making dandelion root tea. <laughs> and he said, well, yes. <laughs> I just, you know, I think, I think it, you know, it, it, it seems novel to do that, you know? I, I, I love reading some of the literature because they don't just call it tea, they call them aqueous extracts, right? <laughs> aqueous extracts. Uh, they, they have to come up with a term for them because they can't just call it tea. Um, Dandelion root tea in, in the treatment of cancer, though, absolutely amazing. Um, uh, uh, you know, also increases lymphocyte numbers significantly. Um, you know, I, I, 
I love the little list um, on the bottom there of uh, dandelion extract and being effective against those bacterial pathogens. Of course, including E. coli, right? Fantastic stuff to use. Um, it, it made me wonder because my grandma always told me that you can actually take dandelion tea and wash your vegetables in cold dandelion tea. And I always wondered, was that because, was she saying that because of, you know, the stuff you get from the store is what she would wash very, very well. And I always wondered, is that because she had this intuitive knowledge that it would kill the bacteria um, on those store-bought fruits and vegetables? Um, Pediomelum esculentum, uh, known in English as breadroot, known in English also as prairie turnip, um, one of our most beloved foods on the Great Plains, and I say our because I've lived there so long, timsila is a complex carbohydrate. How many of you have ever tasted this? I, I just have to ask. Quite a few of you. Um, I, I almost hate that it's called turnip in English because it makes people think of a certain thing and a certain flavor. And to me, they don't taste anything like a garden turnip. Um, they, they don't even really have the same texture. The flavor and texture of, of breadroot, uh, something that the French called pomme de terre, apple of the, apple of the earth or apple of the prairie, um, is absolutely fantastic and delicious. And, um, you know, very, uh, I remember Alma Snell, this uh, crow elder, she was one of my teachers and she taught me that you can mash it up and feed it to people as a porridge to people who are having um, difficulties, you know, gastrointestinal illnesses uh, such as IBS and gastroenteritis and even Crohn's disease. And um, I have treated, I think, 15 people now just with porridge, you know, mashed up timsila uh, with unbelievable results. People who had been suffering with this weight gain and loss for, you know, a, a large portion of their lives, you know, these. these medicines, these relatives of ours change lives. I sh I'm, I'm actually out of time and I have so much more I want to talk to you guys about, but I'll hurry up. Um, uh, oak or the, the glorious acorn, um, which is still utilized readily by people on the California coast, isn't just a delicious edible. It isn't just useful for acorn soup and, and acorn porridge. Um, it's also wonderful as a medicine, uh, significantly antibacterial. And if you've ever eaten an acorn without processing it first, you know that it's very high in tannins right? It'll dry your mouth, that mouth out quite a bit with all those tannins. But those tannins are so important uh, in the treatment of certain diseases. Um, speeding up a little here, but I want to make sure to talk about nettles. Um, absolutely. Uh, I could have filled an entire presentation with nettles, stinging nettles, because even though they're they're you know they're protecting themselves by having all these stinging hairs all along the length of the plant, they're one of my favorite edible and medicinal plants. And I get asked often, you know, if you could only take one plant to the moon with you, just one plant, what would it be? It would absolutely hands down be nettles, because not only is it deliciously edible. Not only is it effective against arthritis, not only can you use it to, to release a pinched nerve, not only can you use it um, as a tea, particularly for pregnant women who need a lot of those nutrients. You know, I drank nettle tea every day, uh, every time I was pregnant. Not only is it amazing as an anti-inflammatory for allergies and asthma, uh, and, and uh, you know, not only does, does it heal eczema and psoriasis in, in a salve, and even treat dandruff and even help to regrow hair, it's being used in all these expensive, you know, commercial shampoos that you see on TV in the middle of the night. Um, you know, it's, it's and, and not only, you know, benign prostatic hyperplasia, uh, uh, like, seen to reduce the symptoms of, of those prostate illnesses in men significantly, you know, it's also delicious. My husband makes the most amazing nettle pesto that you can possibly imagine with blanched nettles and, and toasted acorns and wild onions. Uh, you know, our traditional foods don't have to be boring. They're not boring. They're delicious. We have to change our palate to recognize that. Uh, and nettle soup, of course, eaten all over the world as the first food of spring. Uh, fantastic. 
Um, choke cherries, of course, um, contain cyanide in the pits. Um, but we eat the pits. We have not developed, um, I, I just want to make it clear, we haven't developed uh, a resistance to cyanide. Um, <laughs> it's through that native science, through the processing of the choke cherries into these dried patties, that we've been able to uh, cause a chemical reaction that causes the cyanide to dissipate and only leave us with all of those amazing medicines that are in the pits. That's what, you know, my, my elders, when I talk to them, they say, you have to eat the pits. Don't try to remove them. That's where all of the medicine is. That's where the complex carbohydrates are, the protein, all of those micronutrients. Um, choke cherries treating a wide range of ailments, sleep disorders, arthritis, muscle damage, and being used now, being investigated against Alzheimer's to help with Alzheimer's. You know, uh, these foods as medicines, why did our elders have these amazing memories to be able to write, recite stories from their childhood verbatim? Oh, she's coming to get me. I see her. Okay. <laughs> Hawthorne for the heart. I'm sorry. I, once I get talking about this stuff, I can't stop myself. Um, <laughs> um, uh, some of my, I, you know, some other berries that I just wanted to, to show you guys. Um, okay. I'm done. Did I go over my question time too? Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Fantastic job. I felt awful creeping up, <laughs> up here. Um, and we have time for just one question, which is so sad because I have a hundred of them. I was taking furious notes, but we'll go with this one. Uh, for those of us who don't live in a place where we can harvest these wonderful medicinal foods, how, where, can we find them? Okay, so first let me say that you will be shocked at what is growing right outside your door. Once you learn who these plants are, once you learn about the, the spirit that they have, you will be shocked at what is growing right outside your door in, in your flower bed that you haven't weeded this year. Don't ignore the weeds just to look at your petunias. Look at the weeds as well because some of the things that I talked about um, are probably growing five feet from your door and you just haven't even realized it yet. However, um, there are amazing companies that are online, such as Mountain Rose Herbs, Frontier. Um, there's a Native American-owned one now called Bailey's Herbs um, that I'm, I'm investigating. And so, um, you know, and, and uh, uh, Red Root Herbals, I believe it's called, out of the Southwest, also Native American-owned. Um, you, you can get a lot of these plants, these herbs from there, but, you know, I encourage you to try to go out because part of the way these plants benefit our health is, of course, in the physical activity of going outside and harvesting them, right? And, and, and you know, what, a, what about learning their names, learning who they are, you know, learning them in your language and in my language, um, knowing them by name because that's who they are, right? That's, they're, they're our friends. And so we should know their names. We should know what they look like. Just like I want to be able to know you guys and greet you by name, we should know these plants and greet them by name as well. Um, best resources to explain ways to find process. Um, that's, that's tough because people are the best resources. Uh, however, there are quite a few really good books out there. Um, Samuel Thayer, T-H-A-Y-E-R, has a couple of really fantastic books, and his stuff is just really easy to read. Um, I, you know, sometimes I find it hard to plug people and, and their books. Um, uh, he's he's non-native, but um, he's very respectful and has worked with a lot of people down on Pine Ridge, and um, I've worked with him quite a bit. Um, but, you know, the best resources are your elders and your people. And it's like I say, because I actually teach in the Division of Education, and I tell my students all the time, there's no textbook that you can go to to teach culture wholly right, to really do a good job, you have to go out and you have to talk to elders. You have to talk to your community members and ask these questions and find out. You know, I, I remember I had one assignment. I sent my students out and I said, just go out and ask elders about the flight, you know, why eagles fly in circles. <laughs> that, you know, why do they fly in a, in a circle in the sky? And the answers they got and the incredible science that they brought back into the classroom from the knowledge of our elders was mind-blowing. Um, so I encourage you to, to go out and do that. 
um, plans to introduce species from Europe. Um, so we have, uh, yes, we should not just be promoting them as, as traditional medicine. Burdock and dandelion are indigenous. Um, do not let anyone tell you that they aren't. Now, there's an indigenous species of burdock and there's an indigenous species of dandelion and they have readily crossed with their invasive um, uh, counterparts that have come across the ocean. My friends and I, uh, it, it's an indigenous group of us um, who try to get back to traditional diets. We have a new diet that we want to try. We want to become invasivores. Because the more we eat these plants and use them for medicine and harvest them before they go to seed, the more likely we are to control their populations. So absolutely, we should be doing that. Thank you guys so much. Real honor. Thank you.